Good morning. Good to have you with us. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Valerie Castro in for Savannah Sellers. Right now on Morning News Now, ready to run. A highly anticipated announcement is expected in just a matter of hours. NBC News has learned that Florida Governor Ron DeSantis will launch his presidential campaign today. This sets the stage for a GOP showdown with former President Donald Trump. We have team coverage with the unique way DeSantis plans to make his announcement and what it all means for the 2024 campaign. Standoff. Progress is reportedly slowing with just one week before the debt limit deadline. This morning, a Democratic official says talks have hit a speed bump, and if no deal is reached, that could lead the U.S. into a catastrophic default. We're not there yet. It really comes down to this. Why are we in the problem? People have spent too much money, and the Democrats want to even spend more than we spent last year. That is not going to happen. We'll have more on this latest setback in talks, plus what both sides are looking for and how far apart they are from reaching a compromise. Reflection and frustration as we mark one year since the deadly elementary school shooting in Uvalde, Texas. This morning, we'll take a look at how the community and the country are commemorating the somber milestone, plus the plea from parents who say not enough has changed. And he's flipping the script in the cartoon world. Joe shares his conversation with one of the producers behind Bob's Burgers and other hit animated shows about the importance of having diversity in the writing room. Good morning, and it's so good to be here with you, Joe. Good to have you with us, Valerie. And we begin this morning with that big announcement from Florida Governor Ron DeSantis that he plans to officially enter the race for the White House. DeSantis will make the announcement at 6 p.m. Eastern during an event on Twitter Spaces with Twitter CEO Elon Musk. Those details were first reported by NBC News. Our Dasha Burns has the details. NBC News is first to report that Florida Governor Ron DeSantis will formally announce he is running for president alongside Twitter CEO Elon Musk. It's an unconventional approach and an unconventional ally for launching a bid for the White House. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis ready to jump in. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. And now NBC News learning exclusive details about that announcement, which will feature a surprise guest. DeSantis set to reveal his presidential run in a discussion with billionaire Twitter CEO Elon Musk that will be live streamed on Twitter Spaces, the site's platform for audio chats, according to three sources familiar with the plans. Um, Musk first tweeted his support for DeSantis last year, and a source familiar with conversations between Musk and the governor's team tells NBC News Musk does not think Republican frontrunner former President Trump can win and believes DeSantis is the future. My preference, and I think would be the preference of most Americans is really to have someone fairly normal in office. Musk saying he won't be making any endorsements. I'm not at this time um, planning to endorse uh, any particular candidate, um, but I am uh, interested in uh, you know, X slash Twitter being somewhat of a public town square. The Florida governor will instantly become Mr. Trump's top rival. Ron DeSantis, did anyone ever hear of DeSantis? DeSanctimonious. Their feud has been escalating. Just this weekend, DeSantis slamming Trump over his pandemic response. We can never allow warp speed to trump informed consent in this country ever again. Now, the Sunshine State ground zero in a growing Republican divide. Those backing Trump... I would pick Trump. Trump has already proven what he could do. And DeSantis. DeSantis versus Trump. <laughs> Who would you pick? If it was just those two? Yeah. I would pick DeSantis. DeSantis all the way. Why? Well, I want a winner. The event on Twitter Spaces will be followed by a gathering of donors and fundraisers here in Miami who will be raising money for the governor's campaign. And next week, after Memorial Day, he will take a big swing through those critical early states as an official candidate. All right, Dasha, thank you. Let's bring in senior national politics reporter John Allen for a closer look at how the Republican primary field is now shaping up. Good morning, John. So let's start with DeSantis's choice to make this announcement during a discussion with Elon Musk. As far as we know, this is just going to be audio, no visuals here. I mean, what are the advantages of tying himself to Musk or is this a risky strategy? Joe, I think I think both are, are the case. There are some advantages and there are some risks. Uh, the big advantage, as Ron DeSantis has shown in the past, is he likes to have a heavyweight endorser come in and help him in a primary. In 2018, when he was running uh, for the Republican nomination for governor of Florida, 
that big heavyweight that came in for him was Donald Trump. Turns out Donald Trump is not available this time around <laughs> because Donald Trump is uh, leading for that nomination for the presidency uh, that Ron DeSantis would like. So helpful to DeSantis in his view uh, to have somebody uh, with a big name like Musk and in addition somebody who has a big following that overlaps with Donald Trump's following. There are a lot of people who are fans of both Trump and Musk perhaps uh, DeSantis can pull a little bit away of those people away from Trump. The, the risk here, of course, is uh, that Elon Musk outshines uh, Ron DeSantis, and it makes DeSantis look uh, a little bit smaller. And, of course, uh, the possibility that DeSantis could be tied to some of the more controversial things uh, that Elon Musk has said uh, in the past, particularly in a general election. But, you know, DeSantis will probably take that if he has to defend himself in a general election. Also curious to see if this gets Trump to actually tweet again now that he's able to do that. So Musk is hosting the event, but says he isn't going to endorse any particular candidate for president just yet. So this is not an endorsement, Musk says. What do you make of that? <laughs> I, make of, I make of it that uh, Elon Musk is being coy. Uh, certainly the DeSantis folks believe this is tantamount to an endorsement. I think anybody that sees Elon Musk appearing with Ron DeSantis will take that uh, as an endorsement, particularly if Musk is not appearing with other candidates. Um, and given what he's said in the past, uh, both publicly and privately about this race. So, uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, uh, it is an endorsement unless Musk goes out there and endorses someone else. So DeSantis obviously trails former President Trump in the polls right now. A major group backing Trump has already attacked DeSantis, calling him out of touch for doing this announcement on Twitter. So what is realistically DeSantis's plan for trying to close the gap with the front runner? I mean, I think the first thing that he's going to have to do is go after some of the Trump base that is with uh, Trump. Uh, you know, the, the, that's the overlap. That's where uh, you know, there were uh, certainly DeSantis fans um, before he was running against Trump and probably still are uh, people who see him as the future or the next guy. He needs to pull them in. Uh, he needs to fight Donald Trump for Trump's voters. And I think part of uh, part of joining Elon Musk on Twitter for this uh, launch event is uh, trying to angle at some of those very people who are both uh, fans of Donald Trump's and of Ron DeSantis's. Well, we've certainly seen DeSantis's strategy leading up to now after this announcement is made. What do we expect to see from him in the days that follow to try and build momentum? Uh, great question, Joe. Uh, the, the only thing we've learned so far is uh, that he plans to go to early states, early voting states uh, after Memorial Day. We're not expecting a lot before uh, Memorial Day other than a big donor conference that he has uh, this week in uh, Miami. Um, but we have seen Ron DeSantis in these early states before. He's been to Iowa. He's been to New Hampshire. Uh, and so uh, we'll just have to wait to see what it looks like under the official banner of a campaign. John Allen, good to have you with us this morning. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Turning now to South Carolina, where state senators have voted in favor of banning most abortions after an ultrasound detects a fetal heartbeat. Heartbeats are normally detected around six weeks, but for most people, that's before they even know they're pregnant. The new bill makes exceptions for fatal fetal anomalies, the patient's life and health, and rape or incest up to 12 weeks. The only five women senators in the state's Congress, three Republicans, one Democrat and one independent, attempted to block the bill from passing by delivering scathing speeches on the floor. But nearly all of their Republican colleagues said the bill was necessary to reduce the number of abortions in the state. Republican Senate Majority Leader Shane Massey had this to say about the current state of abortions in South Carolina. South Carolina has begun, become the, the abortion capital of the Southeast. And there's really, there's no other way to say that. The bill is now headed to the desk of Governor Henry McMaster. In a tweet, the South Carolina governor said in part, I look forward to signing this bill into law as soon as possible. NBC News legal analyst and former prosecutor Kristen Gibbons-Fedden joins us now to break down the implications of this latest abortion ban. Kristen, good morning. This ban reinstates a law that was enacted immediately after Roe versus Wade was overturned, but the state's highest court overturned the bill because it violated South Carolina's constitutional right to privacy. So how were state senators able to pass this new version? Well, similar to how the anti-abortion proponents after the Dobbs decision came down kind of strategically awaited uh, the shift in the Supreme Court, so did the South Carolina Republican leadership. 
you know, with the state Supreme Court's um, leadership under Justice Hearn, it was only a narrow strike down with the three to two vote that struck down that six week, pretty much six week uh, abortion bill. So now that Justice Hearn has had to retire or step down, with her retirement, Judge Gary Hill is the judge who's really much going to be reported to be a conservative. He's going to be tasked with the important task to reinterpret, if you will, the right to privacy under that state, under South Carolina's um, state constitution. And if he and his view diverges from her stance, it's going to increase the likelihood for the bill to be, up, um, be struck down. Uh, or excuse me, the bill to be upheld. And therefore, just by changing that shift in the court could result in a different interpretation of the law, which could cause this bill, which is very similar, to be upheld. And this bill allows parents of a minor to file a civil suit against a doctor who performs an abortion. How does that compare to federal charges for doctors in that state? Um, they could face those if they perform an abortion after the heartbeat is detected. Well, it's interesting because physicians are increasingly being targeted by anti-abortion legislation. With this new bill, um, the, the doctors could face felony charges if they perform an abortion um, that fails to comply with those strict legal requirements. And that, with that particular charge, they could have a fine of up to $10,000 and a prison sentence of up to two years. And keep in mind, these are just doctors really trying to uh, utilize their medical judgment as well as interpret the law. And the judge and those doctors could also face civil penalties as well, Valerie, and if they perform it, um, there's other uh, implications that they can do, but it really just impairs their ability to fully practice medicine, fully engage in their Hippocratic Oath, um, and really help their patients. All right, we appreciate the breakdown. Kristen gibbons Fedden. thanks so much. There are new concerns this morning about the progress of those high-stakes negotiations to raise the debt ceiling. A Democratic official familiar with the talks tells NBC News that negotiations have hit a, quote, speed bump. White House officials and Republican congressional leaders had said they were moving closer to a deal to avert a potential first-ever default in the U.S. And according to a Democratic source familiar with the talks, the two sides are expected to meet again today. While they have called recent negotiations productive, one of Speaker McCarthy's negotiators says there is still a lot of work to do. I don't think things are going well until the White House understands that they have a spending crisis, they have a tax crisis, and they have a debt crisis. We're not going to be able to make this deal. We're joined by NBC News senior congressional reporter Scott Wong and NBC News digital senior White House reporter Peter Nicholas. Good morning to both of you. Peter, let's start with you in this new reporting out this morning, the so-called speed bump, according to this Democratic official. We have to point out we've not gotten a response from the speaker or his team about that claim, but what can you tell us about this? Well, it doesn't look good right now. Uh, both sides still are far apart. Um, President Biden came back early, cut short his uh, trip from Asia to participate in this, uh, but we've not seen a breakthrough. And I think the sticking points are very traditional. I mean, Republicans uh, want deep cuts in non-defense spending. Uh, President Biden is saying that he will accept some spending cuts, but nothing that's severe. And then there's a disagreement over taxes. Uh, Biden wants what he calls a balanced approach, where some taxes would go up uh, for wealthy Americans. There would be a closing of some tax loopholes. Republicans are not willing to accept any tax increases. So the clock is ticking down. We only have about a week before um, the nation won't be able to pay its bills. And that, in turn, is going to set off some stock market uh, gyrations that could cut into people's 401ks. So this is getting serious very quick. This is very serious. Yeah, and Scott, and only getting worse. Scott, because of that, I mean, there is so much pressure both on the president and House Speaker McCarthy to get a deal done, to avoid defaulting. Where do things stand right now from House Speaker McCarthy's perspective? Well, Speaker McCarthy has laid out a number of red lines. Peter has uh, mentioned a few of them. Uh, Speaker McCarthy has said no uh, cuts to defense spending, pointing to the president's trip uh, to Japan and meeting with the G7 uh, on several national security issues related to China and other uh, challenges in the region. Uh, Speaker McCarthy has also talked about no new taxes, and he's also ruled out uh, you know, to the dismay of perhaps several people on Capitol Hill, a short-term extension of the debt ceiling, uh, you know, that would take off this option if we were to be right up against 
the deadline of June 1st, just next week. And so uh, this creates a very narrow, limited path. The White House and uh, Capitol Hill Democrats, including Hakeem Jeffries, the, the House leader, uh, have said they're open to freezing spending cuts. You know, if McCarthy wants to talk about spending, then they have said that they are open to spending cuts. Uh, but that is a non-starter with Speaker McCarthy and House Republicans. And so, again, we have this impasse, the sticking point, the main sticking point, again, comes back to spending. And McCarthy spoke about this yesterday. Let's take a listen to what he had to say about it. It really comes down to this. Why are we in the problem we're in? People have spent too much money, and the Democrats want to even spend more than we spent last year. We're trying to condense everything in a short time frame. The House passed a bill, and the Senate never passed one. So now it's more difficult. You, what else do you have to negotiate with? Um, from a lot of different perspectives? But we can still finish in time. So, Peter, we are getting a clearer picture of what each side is looking for. Well, let's break it down. Explain what some of the big sticking points are and just how far to, apart they really are right now. Well, they seem quite far apart. I mentioned differences over uh, spending and taxes. There are some areas that where you can see maybe the path to a compromise. For example, um, on permanent reform, uh, both sides seem open to the idea of loosening permit requirements that would boost uh, energy, inf energy uh, infrastructure spending, and uh, it would speed up those kinds of projects. So that's one possibility. They might be able to claw back some unspent COVID 19 money. Uh, so that would be, you know, some billions of dollars in savings there. And it's possible that um, by cleaning up how the government pays for Medicare, for example, there might be some excess and some waste in government spending on certain Medicare programs uh, where they might be able to forge a compromise. But there are quite, quite a, a few differences that still remain. So we'll see. Yeah, and Scott, I mean, here's the thing. There really isn't much time left because if there's a deal, Congress is going to need, what, 72 hours to try and prove it and review it and vote on it. Talk about this tight timeline here. Exactly. Uh, we know that there are now nine days left before the June 1st deadline that uh, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has laid out the date, the X date, when uh, the United States will run out of money to pay its, its bills and its debt obligations. Uh, key GOP negotiators, including Garrett Graves, who is in the room with these White House officials, uh, came out yesterday, talked to reporters, and said that uh, really he thinks what's going to happen at this point is because of this impasse, uh, they are going to probably send home uh, House lawmakers uh, later this week on Thursday, wrap up votes, send them home for the, for the Memorial Day uh, weekend, and then... Uh, hopefully they can get a deal. They think there's still a narrow, narrow window uh, where they can avoid default, perhaps get a deal by Monday, setting up a Tuesday vote. It, it, it hands the process off to the United States Senate, which is a whole nother story, but uh, they do think at this point there is still a very, very narrow window in which to avoid default. Uh, we'll see what happens. It remains to be seen how this is all going to play out. Going to be cutting it close no matter what. All right, Scott, Peter, thank you both. Appreciate it. Writer E. Jean Carroll has asked a New York City judge to update her pending defamation lawsuit against former President Donald Trump. Carroll is requesting the addition of a new claim to the suit after Trump called her a, quote, whack job during a CNN town hall two weeks ago. The former president made that comment just one day after a jury found him liable for sexual abuse and defamation against Carroll, ordering him to pay her $5 million and... $5 million. Turning to another New York City legal case regarding former President Trump, he appeared in court virtually yesterday regarding his pending criminal case. A Manhattan judge has set a trial date in that case for March 25th of next year, which coincides with primary season. In that case, Trump has pleaded not guilty to 34 felony charges of falsifying business records. This morning, flags are flying at half-staff across Texas, marking one year since one of the worst school shootings in American history. One year ago today, an 18-year-old gunman broke into an elementary school in Uvalde, killing 19 children and two teachers. And this morning, questions still remain over both the shooting and the police response. For many, the reminders of the tragedy are everywhere. Not a moment goes by that I, and I know we, aren't confronted, aren't thinking about all that's going on. 
NBC News correspondent Jay Gray is in Uvalde this morning. Jay, good morning. We know the community really came together in the wake of this shooting. What is the mood like there today, and what are some of the events planned to mark one year? Yeah, Joe, very somber, as you would expect. You could see by the sign just behind us. We're on the outskirts uh, of the city right now, trying to give some space to the uh, victims, family members on this difficult day. They're going to come together as a group a bit later and have asked for privacy after what's been a very public and, and very painful 12 months here. Uh, the city has no events plans, and they say they do that in deference to those family members and their privacy. There will be an event at an amphitheater here, a group gathering to release some butterflies to honor uh, the victims. Mariachis will play in the town plaza at noon, and that's an area where a fountain is in the, the downtown section of this small town. It's a place where a makeshift memorial started just uh, days after the attack, and it's really grown into a permanent marker at this point to honor the victims of the attack. Jay, we know there are several investigations into both how the shooting happened and how the police responded. Where do those currently stand? It's a great question, Valerie, and one that the family members continue to ask, and they say they're just not getting any answers on that. They and the mayor, in fact, here in Uvalde have said there's been enough time. The investigations need to end and some action needs to move forward. There is the investigation that's ongoing by the DA and, and just in the last couple of weeks she said she's not to the point where she's ready to move forward, that there's more work to be done. Then there's an independent investigation uh, that was started by the city here. They hired a firm to do an independent investigation. They say that they're stuck because the DA won't turn over information from her investigation. What family members are saying is we're waiting, have been suffering for a year and still have really no solid information. Jay, in the wake of this tragedy, there was also a flood of stricter gun reform bills that were filed in Texas. Quickly, though, not a lot of them passed, right? Zero. Joe, to be real honest, and some of the family members here drove back and forth from Uvalde to Austin to testify for 11 straight weeks, some waiting 13 hours to share their grief and call for stricter gun laws. And again, none of it even made it to a debate on the full floor of the legislature. All right, Jay Gray reporting from Uvalde. Jay, thank you so much. This morning, we're learning more about the 19-year-old who police say purposely crashed a U-Haul truck near the White House. He's facing multiple charges. NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander has the latest details. The dramatic crash caught on camera just a block from the White House. The driver ramming this U-Haul truck into security barricade before backing up and doing it again. I heard this loud bang and it was, I looked behind and there was this huge U-Haul truck just out of nowhere. Chris Zaboyi was jogging when it all unfolded. I thought maybe it was like a drunk driver or just an accident and then it backed up and then rammed it again. Tonight, the suspect, 19-year-old Cy Varsith Kandula from Chesterfield, Missouri, is in custody. According to court documents, Kandula says he rented the truck and drove directly to the White House. He told agents his goal was to, quote, get to the White House, seize power, and be put in charge of the nation, and that he would, quote, kill the president if that's what I have to do. And he praised Nazis. Authorities seized a Nazi flag with a swastika on it, seen on the ground outside the U-Haul. But no weapons or explosives were found inside the truck. Now he's expected to be charged with threatening to kill or harm a president, vice president, or family member, assault with a dangerous weapon, as well as reckless operation of a motor vehicle and trespassing. The incident is the latest threat to high-profile political figures and their families. From the violent attack on then-House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's husband to last summer's arrest of an armed man outside conservative Justice Brett Kavanaugh's home, that suspect now charged with attempted murder. Capitol Police say they opened more than 7,500 investigations of threats against lawmakers last year alone. Hate, intolerance, and violence are part of a disturbing trend. President Biden was inside the White House at the time of the crash. No one was harmed, fortunately. The suspect was in Superior Court Tuesday and will make his first appearance in federal court Wednesday. Back to you. All right, Peter, thanks so much. Now let's get a check on your morning news now. Weather and some storms could be coming your way. For more on that, let's bring in meteorologist Michelle Grossman. Michelle, good morning. 
Good morning to you both. Great to see you. Yeah, we'll see those storms. We're going to see the umbrellas up for many of us across the country. We are stuck in a, a stormy pattern. You can see radar showing us that a lot of rain is falling in the Intermountain West, the Central and Southern Plains, into the Southeast along the Gulf Coast, and then a little bit of rain throughout the northern parts of the Great Lakes into the northern parts of the Northeast. We have a cold front that's moving through there. So we're going to be watching that as we go throughout the day. Those are the big weather stories. Lots of little fronts across the country. Really warm in the north. That's helping to aid some of the storms. Really warm in the south as well. Temperatures soaring into the 80s and 90s in portions of the southern plains. That's going to help to spark severe storms later on today. And then once again, we're watching heavy rain throughout portions of the southeast. We're looking at Florida, especially where we could see another two to three inches of rain, even up to four in some spots. So we're concerned about the severe threat once again this afternoon. We saw that on Monday. We saw it on Tuesday, pretty much in these same spots. We're going to see it once again later on this afternoon into the evening hours, expecting that daytime heating kind of to stir up those storms in portions of Colorado, New Mexico, into Texas, Oklahoma. Winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour, so damaging winds. Also the chance of some hail. We had large hail yesterday on Monday, and we're going to expect that once again today. So rainfall rates, we're looking at a lot of rain that could cause some flash flooding in spots. Parts of the northern and western parts of Texas, especially Amarillo, you could see some heavy rainfall in addition to those severe storms. Same story as we head throughout Florida along the Gulf Coast, all those bright colors showing us where that heavy rain will be falling. And once again, we're going to see the chance for some flooding, even some flash flooding where you see that blue shading portions of the Intermountain West, the Southern Plains into the Southeast. We are looking at the chance for flash flooding. We do want to mention this because we are thinking about our friends in Guam, Super Typhoon Mawar. We're looking at 15 miles north northeast of Guam, so it's it's brushing the northern parts of Guam right now. Winds at 140 miles per hour. You guys, this is an historical storm here. We haven't seen a storm this big there or this strong since 2002. So it is 14 hours ahead in Guam, nighttime, and they're looking at a lot of power outages. We'll keep you posted on this storm. Back to you. All right, Michelle. Thank you so much. Coming up on Morning News Now, a time-honored tradition. This morning, we're kicking off New York's Fleet Week with the U.S. Navy. Later this hour, hear more about this year's celebrations. First, though, there are new developments this morning for an American journalist detained in Russia, the latest on a ruling by a Moscow court to keep him behind bars through this summer. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Detained American journalist Evan Gershkovich will spend at least another three months in a Russian prison. During a pre-trial hearing, a Moscow court ordered the Wall Street Journal reporter's detention to be extended until August 30th. Now, Gershkovich has first detained in Russia in March on espionage charges. He's facing up to 20 years in prison if convicted. The Wall Street Journal released a statement after the hearing saying, while we expected there would be no change to Evan's wrongful detention, we were deeply disappointed the accusation Accusations are demonstrably false, and we continue to demand his immediate release. NBC News foreign correspondent Matt Bradley joins us now. So, Matt, what do we know about Evan Gershkovich's status at this point, and have Russian officials given a reason as to why his detention was extended? Yeah, I mean, this is pretty typical. And so this is something that, while disappointing, as we heard from the Wall Street Journal, this is not going to surprise anybody, least of all. And I think the person who's least surprised here is going to be Gershkovich himself, because, of course, he understands the Russian legal system. He's been following these cases and reporting on them very closely. And he knows that there's a 90 percent chance he's going to be convicted and that he could be in pretrial detention for as long as a year. Paul Whelan, uh, the former U.S. Marine who was convicted back in 2020, he had to spend 15 months in pretrial detention before he was eventually convicted of espionage and sentenced to 16 years in jail. And guys, you could better believe that Gershkovich himself is looking forward to that conviction. And if that sounds a little odd, he's waiting for it because he knows a conviction is almost entirely inevitable. And it's only when he's convicted that he's going to be able to look forward to American diplomatic efforts to try to get him out, including a prisoner exchange. And we saw from Brittany Griner, the U.S. basketball star last year, and others that you need a conviction in a Russian court and a sentence in order to move ahead with prisoner exchanges. And that is really Gershkovich's best hope for salvation at this point. Guys, so, so Matt, Gershkovich's parents, U.S. Embassy officials were actually at the hearing. Were they able to speak with him at all or just get a read on how he's holding up? 
Well, we heard from Gershkovich's parents. The Wall Street Journal quoted them, and they said that, you know, they were happy to see him. This isn't really the first time that U.S. officials have been able to see him. Uh, the U.S. ambassador was able to meet with him a couple uh, in April last month and uh, reported that he was in good condition. And, you know, we were able to see Gershkovich. He's, he looks as though in that past uh, court appearance, he looks as though he's healthy. He was standing up. He, he assumed sort of a defiant posture in front of the court. So this is all a good sign. And the fact that his parents were there, we don't really know if they were able to communicate with him because the fact is, is that we didn't actually see Gershkovich in that trial. But, you know, we do know that Gershkovich uh, is in good health. And we've heard this from various other sources from the U.S. Embassy and others, that it seems as though he's, he's healthy and he's fighting. Guys. Ma Matt, do we know whether the Biden administration has had any communication recently with Russian officials about the detainment? No, I mean, we, we don't really know. I mean, the fact is, is that we're told that the Biden administration and the State Department that they're going to be working on this every single day. Crucially, the Biden administration has classified his case as wrongfully detained, which opens up a menu of diplomatic options that the U.S. can work with, including, as I mentioned, that prisoner swap. But when it comes to the State Department and diplomatic efforts, the U.S. knows from experience that the only way that Gershkovich is ever going to be uh, released in a prisoner swap is if he's convicted. Again, he has to be convicted and sentenced and then then and only then can the process begin in earnest to bring him back home. Guys. Okay. Matt Bradley, thank you so much. More international headlines now. China is taking steps to strengthen relations with Russia this morning. Claudio Lavanga joins us now from Rome with that and more. Good morning, Claudio. Good morning, guys. Yes, today Russia and China signed yet another set of agreements in Beijing despite uh, disapproval by the West of their uh, relationship, especially as the war in Ukraine rages on. Now, the memorandum signed by Russia's prime minister and his Chinese counterpart includes an agreement to deepen cooperation in trade services, a deal on export of agricultural products to China, and another on sports cooperation. Russia's prime minister, Mikhail Mishustin, said that today relations between Russia and China are at an unprecedented high level. Now let's go to Cardiff in Wales, where violent, uh, violent riots erupted after teenage boys died in a ro road accident. Now protesters accused the police of being involved in the crash that killed the teenagers. A claim the police denies, saying its officers arrived at the scene only after the incident. South Wales police said that during the protest, vehicles were set on fire and several officers were injured. And let me take you to France, where short domestic flights will be banned if the same journey can be completed with a two and a half hours ride by train instead. The country's transport minister called the decree an essential step and a strong symbol in the policy of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But critics say that this is merely a symbolic move as passengers are already choosing high-speed trains over flights for short journeys, and therefore it will have very little impact on emissions, guys. All right. I find trains more relaxing anyways. So. All right. More scenic. Exactly. <laughs> Fadia, thank you so much. True. Coming up, going one-on-one -on -one with the Secretary of Transportation. That we have built is extraordinarily safe, and we're going to make sure that passengers stay safe, and that's the top priority. After the break, more from Secretary Pete Buttigieg, including his message to Americans ahead of the busy summer travel season. You're watching Morning News Now. Welcome back. You might be packing swimsuits and sunscreen in preparation for the summer travel season. Well, airports are preparing, too, as they brace themselves for the biggest surge in nearly two decades. The TSA is predicting that around 10 million people could hit the airways this weekend alone. That number is up 11 percent from last year. Big question, can the airlines handle it? NBC News Now anchor and senior Washington correspondent Hallie Jackson sat down with Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg to discuss some of of these travel concerns. I think some people are having flashbacks to last Memorial Day and the nightmare headlines. Is there going to be a nightmare version to come Memorial Day? Well, let me start with the improvements that we've seen this year. So far in 2023, every single month, cancellation rates have stayed under 2%. That's very encouraging, but we're not out of the woods. We have seen demand come roaring back for air travel, and the system has struggled to keep up. So a lot of improvement. 
not out of the woods yet. What is your level of confidence right now in the system writ large? Can the system handle it? Are you confident? Well, first of all, uh, the system uh, that we have built is extraordinarily safe, and we're going to make sure that passengers stay safe, and that's the top priority. But, but you know passengers' concern is less their safety, and it's more the convenience. It's more the sort of headache of it all. Yeah, I think once you are certain about safety, then we look at the convenience issue that was so frustrating last year, unacceptable really, which is why I summoned the leaders of the airlines. We uh, ratcheted up the customer service protections and the enforcement, and we got a lot of meaningful gains. Those are going to pay off this summer. So far this year, that picture is much improved. We're pressing airlines to keep it that way, and we're acting to do what we can to help with what's under our control. But there is a I think a bit of a trust issue for Americans. You have the number of complaints, I know the new numbers that just came out just in January, basically doubled from where they were the, years, the year before. People aren't happy. People are stressed when they're going out and flying. Why should they trust you when you say that you think these changes will pay off during this incredibly busy travel season we're about to hit? Well, th this is not a, a, uh, a qualitative thing. This is very direct and objective. Did you get delayed or not? Did you get canceled or not? And if the airline owes you a refund, did you get it or not? We've gotten over a billion dollars in refunds to passengers just since I got here through our enforcement tools. And I think one of the reasons that we're seeing a lot of these complaints come in is that passengers are seeing when they do complain to us about an airline not taking care of them, we follow up and we make sure that they get taken care of. So we're gonna continue building up these protections that did not exist even a year ago. But of course, the best way to deal with this is not for us to come in and have to enforce and issue fines and beat up airlines. It's for airlines to take care of these issues in the first place. And they've stepped up, there's a long way to go. You've had a lot of praise for Billy Nolan, who is leaving his job as acting FAA administrator. There is still no nominee that's been put forward. How is it possible that there is still not somebody who is being picked by this administration to take on that role, especially given the turbulent times that we've talked about in the in the airline industry? Well, the administration picked a new uh, nominee almost a year ago, and who partisanship, his, his name and, from yeah, partisanship right. and obstruction got in the way of that. Now, through all of that, our acting administrator uh, has done a terrific job. Uh, you know, even though it's it's not a simple thing to prepare a nomination package to go to Congress, uh, that's obviously something that uh, we now need to do again because of the obstruction that got in the way of our last nominee. So what's the timeline on that? I don't have news to make on that in this interview, but uh, obviously it's something there's a lot of urgency around in the administration. Have you received assurances from Acting Administrator Nolan that he'll stay on until there is a nominee, if in fact there is a delay? Well, uh, we're going to make sure that uh, there's continuity and strong leadership no matter what. But of course, what is most desirable here is to have the Senate confirm the president's nominee uh, so that we have that certainty for the years ahead. Let me ask you about some other issues that are sort of in your portfolio, in your purview. What regrets do you have about your response to what happened in East Palestine? What would you have done differently? I do think that we missed an opportunity to communicate more clearly with all the misinformation that came to the people of East Palestine. And it's one of the reasons why I broke with the norm. Normally, a transportation secretary does not go to an active hazmat site or an active crash site. But in this case, I thought it was worth breaking that norm in order to be there to directly communicate with people on the ground about how this administration was supporting them and to communicate with the country about the safety reforms that are needed. Do you regret not having gone sooner? Well, again, I, I was upholding the norm, which is that you stay out of the way of first responders and NTSB. Uh, but I do think, had I known the amount of misinformation that would be directed at the people of East Palestine, uh, we would have taken more steps to make sure that they got more accurate information sooner in the process. You've talked about lessons learned from that process and that experience. Is that the biggest one? Well, I think the biggest lessons have to do with making sure that we have even more teeth in our railroad enforcement. East Palestine woke Americans up to something that I think a lot of people in railroading knew, but I think most Americans didn't, which is that derailments have always been a daily occurrence in this country. They're still, they not, still happen all the time. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's not something that we should just sit back and say, oh, well, there's nothing that can be done. Now, let's be clear. Uh, the number of accidental railroad deaths is in the single digits, but I want it to be zero. I've covered you since you were running for president yourself back several years ago. And one of the things that you said at the time was that it was time for a new generation of leadership. Your boss has announced he is looking for re-election here. Does that represent a new generation of democratic leadership? President Biden assembled an administration that reflects the country that we serve. And I think about this as the youngest member at a very diverse cabinet table that reflects all generations and all backgrounds. And has been very clear about his intention, and I think has delivered on that, to empower new generations of leaders and new generations of Americans. So to Americans who would say, including Democrats, that he is too old for this job, you would say? 
I would say name a president in modern times who has been able to do much, uh, as much as this administration has in just two years. And imagine what we can accomplish if we stick together and finish the job. Do you believe the president is the only Democrat who can beat Donald Trump? Again, I, I can't talk about campaigns and elections while I'm sitting in this chair because I'm here in an official capacity. But what I'll say is uh, the record and the accomplishments of this administration are extraordinary. And by the way, uh, this administration has delivered on a number of things that the last administration said it would do and failed to do. Our thanks to Hallie Jackson for that interview ahead of the big holiday weekend. Coming up, celebration and tradition. New York's Fleet Week kicks off today. When we return, what to expect this year, plus more on the meaning behind all those festivities. Welcome back. One sure sign of the unofficial start of summer here in New York is the start of Fleet Week, which kicks off today. It's a week-long celebration that honors the Navy, Marines, and Coast Guard, and it allows New Yorkers to thank them for their service. Now in its 35th year, nearly 2,400 uniformed officers are expected to visit the city. Also visiting us, the Secretary of the Navy, Carlos Del Toro, who is with us here. Good morning, Mr. Secretary. Good to have you with us. Thanks for joining us. I mean, Good morning, we, such a huge event in New York, also in other places. It's something that's immortalized in movies for decades now. Talk to us about the importance of Fleet Week. Oh, it's extremely important. I'm so proud to be the Secretary of the Navy, represent the over 2,500 sailors that are here today. More importantly, the nearly a million service members who serve in our Department of the Navy, Marines and, and uh, sailors as well. We've got uh, four ships here this week. We've got an Italian ship and a Canadian ship. So it's great uh, for the Navy to be back in my hometown of New York City. You mentioned uh, the Italian ship will be here. Uh, we know the Navy will be th joined by three NATO allies this year, Great yes. Britain, Italy, and Canada. Um, tell us about the significance of having them here. It's extremely important. As you know, our allies and partners are extremely important to the relationship between our navies and their navies and our countries. And so having them here in New York City, working together the way that we operate at sea is very critical. You know, we are a divided nation and perhaps more divided than ever these days. What is it about Fleet Week that can maybe help sometimes bridge some of those divides? Well, it's a reminder that service to country is honorable in so many ways. And I'm so thankful to the people of New York City, the tri-state area, all Americans actually, for supporting our Department of the Navy, our Navy Marine Corps team, and all the services. And it's important that they actually continue to support our service members uh, throughout our country. And it's just critically important because they are the ones who actually protect our national security interests around the globe. What do you look forward to the most as these celebrations get kicked off? Oh, first and foremost, the parade of ships, watching those proud Navy ships come in at uh, New York Harbor, just like I brought my ship, the USS Bulkley, in in 2001 as commanding officer, one of our just uh, destroyers, for example. So it's a momentous moment being there on the Hudson River and watching that parade of ships come up the Hudson. For those who've never seen it before, ever experienced it in person, maybe they're going to be in New York over the next few days, what do you tell them to, to prepare so that they are ready for Fleet Week? You're going to see a lot of Navy and Marine Corps uniforms out there and uh, be as hospitable to them as you possibly can. Uh, they're all looking for a few good meals in New York City, and what a great <laughs> city to experience uh, everything that's great about our country, right? What does this mean for the service members? For the service members, it's, you know, it's a reminder of service again. The appreciation that they feel and have historically felt over those 35 years that you mentioned for our uniform members, both in the Navy and Marine Corps, is very, very special to them. Because life can sometimes be challenging, you know, when you're deployed overseas. At any one given time, we have a third of our fleet underway, and we have a quarter of our Marine Corps deployed overseas. So the appreciation that they feel on behalf of the citizens of New York, on behalf of all Americans, is very special and unique to them. And if we have any New Yorkers that want to join the Navy and Marine Corps while we're here. We got plenty of recruiters out there as well, too. Uh, we're ready to sign them up. You're hiring. All right. All right. <laughs> Navy and that includes both of you as well, oh, too. Okay. <laughs> Apparently, there's no age limits. All right. <laughs> Navy Secretary Carlos Del Toro, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you being spending some time with us. Great honor to be here. Thank you thank both. Thank you. Coming up, representation in the writer's room. Up next, we are flipping the script with one of the masterminds behind the hit animated show Bob's Burgers about how diversity behind the scenes makes all the difference on screen.
Welcome back. Last night at the Cannes Film Festival, one of this year's most eagerly anticipated movies had its premiere. Tom Hanks, Rita Wilson, Scarlett Johansson, and Brian Cranston were among the stars on the red carpet for director Wes Anderson's new movie, Asteroid City. The film is about an alien invasion in a fictional 1950s American desert town. It got a six-minute standing ovation, and early reviews have been positive. You can catch the movie in theaters next month. Joe, are you a Wes Anderson film You know, uh, fan? I love Wes Anderson, and that is quite the cast. I'm looking forward to that one. That sounds good. All right, thanks, Valerie. Now to our series, Flipping the Script, featuring people on screen, on stage, and behind the scenes, shining a spotlight on diversity. Enter Jamil Saleem. The Emmy-nominated writer has worked on some of Hollywood's most popular animated series, like Bob's Burgers and South Park. But success didn't come easy. After struggling to make it as an actor, he turned to writing. Now comes a new chapter, the Hollywood writer's strike, which has put projects across the industry on pause. How much fun is it to write for animated shows? Growing up, I, I, I was a couch potato, like 100%. I was Saturday morning cartoons. I was up at 6 a.m. I was glued to the TV till like noon. And the, the idea that I get to, you know, like write these ridiculous jokes it's just it's a dream it's really pretty crazy jameel salim has written for some of the most popular animated shows on tv including bob's burgers where he's the co-executive producer but that was not always the dream Ten thousand people a month moved to la to be actors and writers and directors and all that stuff so you weren't alone i you know i wasn't alone i didn't realize the level of competition i as a black actor who grew up watching like you know, Nora Ephron and Woody Allen movies, I'm not going to get to audition for those type of movies. You know, I was auditioning for gangbangers and prison escapees and stuff like that. So that's kind of what took me into writing. Initially, I started writing for myself because I knew I wouldn't get a chance to audition for the type of characters I wanted to play. Now that you are in a position where you are helping to create the content, do you see the industry changing? Do you hope you can help the industry change? It's changing, but very slowly. In most of the rooms that I'm in, I'm the only person of color, especially animation. And then when you look at TV, how many black animation shows are on primetime TV? None right now. When I'm out there pitching my shows, it's crazy that there's nothing out there to compare it with. These days, uh, you're spending some time on the picket line. Yeah. Uh, how do you feel about the strike? I think it's necessary. Uh, I, I'm all for it, and I'm out there supporting. Uh, me personally, like I, I'm doing okay. I'm doing great. I know a lot of writers out there are, are not. The top priority, he says, is reconciling the pay disparity between broadcast and streaming, adding that in streaming, the writers' rooms are smaller. You're not going to get any diversity in a room with four people. To anyone out there who's young, sees you and says, I think I want to follow your path. I want to work in, in animation, mm -hmm. uh, especially a young black writer. What would be your message to them? Don't let the, uh, the current status of the industry like discourage you. Um, you can look at the, you know, the current TV lineup and not see any black animation shows. And then you, you know, see all these, you know, iterations of the same show <laughs> keep coming out and from white white content creators and again i'm not complaining like those writers are talented and they're pitching great shows and they should be getting those opportunities but there should be a, a balance do you have faith that'll change yeah i'm gonna change it <laughs> Our thanks to Jamil for talking with us. The season finale for Bob's Burgers just aired this week. You can stream the show right now on Hulu. As for the strike, in response to the Writers Guild's demands, the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers has said that demands for minimum staffing on shows are incompatible with the creative nature of the industry. When it comes to pay, the Alliance says that writers have only recently started to see the 46% increase in streaming residuals following contract negotiations in 2020. Great conversation with Jamil, just talented, so much potential, some movies on the horizon that he's been writing, a lot going on there. I saw Bob's Burgers for the first time this oh, last did. week. Did you like it? It was really good. Really All right, there you it. go, yeah. there you go. I still haven't watched it, so I'll have to check it it's out. Good All right, that does it for this hour of Morning News Now. The news continues right now.
Good Wednesday morning. I'm Valerie Castro in for Savannah Sellers. And I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, a little birdie told me, multiple sources telling NBC News, that Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is expected to officially launch his bid for the White House later today. And he's going to do it in a conversation with billionaire CEO Elon Musk on Twitter. That's the birdie part there. But we're expecting that to look like as the pool for the Republican presidential nomination grows. Grim new details this morning from that security scare just outside of the White House. But we're learning about what exactly motivated the 19-year-old suspect to ram a rental truck multiple times into a security barrier and the charges he now faces. Also this morning, two birds, one stone. We've seen diabetes drugs like Ozempic explode in popularity because of its reported weight loss benefits. Well, now some users are reporting a whole new positive side effect. Did scientists unexpectedly create an anti-addiction medication? We're going to take a closer look. And smashing stereotypes during this AAPI Heritage Month will take a closer look at America's Asian athletes who once longed for a sense of belonging and now run the game. Looking forward to bringing you that story. Good to have you with us this morning. We begin with the 2024 presidential race, and today the Republican field is about to get bigger. After months of speculation, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis will today announce his presidential bid at an event with Elon Musk on Twitter. NBC News correspondent Dasha Burns is in Miami with more details. Even before officially jumping into the race, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis was the only Republican even registering in the polls compared with former President Trump. And he's been hinting at a presidential run for months now. He's been traveling the country, touting what he calls his Florida blueprint. And now he is set to make it official tonight in an unconventional approach and with an unconventional ally, announcing on social media with one of the world's richest men. They call it faith because in the face of darkness, you can see that brighter future. Overnight, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis' wife, Casey, all but launching his presidential campaign, tweeting out this 30-second political ad, writing, America is worth the fight every single time. And this morning, the Florida governor, once endorsed by Donald Trump, now set to directly challenge the former president. Three sources familiar with the planning tell NBC News DeSantis will make his long-suspected presidential ambitions public in a conversation with billionaire Elon Musk on Twitter spaces. He has quite an announcement to make um, and will be the first time that something like this is happening on social media. Musk, who's faced intense scrutiny since purchasing Twitter over his leadership style and controversial posts to his 140 million followers, recently weighing in on the race with CNBC. I wish we could have just a normal human being as president. That's what I want. After launching his campaign, DeSantis plans to visit early voting states after Memorial Day, though he's already been making the rounds, touting what he calls a Florida blueprint. DeSantis has faced some blowback over his governing style, including his ongoing feud with one of Florida's largest employers and revenue generators, Disney, which just scrapped a billion-dollar plan to relocate 2,000 workers to the state. And even before getting in the race, DeSantis has been a favorite Trump target. Ron DeSantis. Did anyone ever hear of DeSantis? De Sanctimonious. And the former president now blasting his launch plan, a Trump advisor telling NBC News, quote, announcing on Twitter is perfect for Ron DeSantis. This way, he doesn't have to interact with people. DeSantis, who once embraced Trump, has begun to fire back, but without naming him, appearing to blame him for recent election losses. We must reject the culture of losing that has infected our party in recent years. And after that announcement, we do expect a more traditional campaign rollout with a launch video and, and visits to early states planned next week. But meanwhile, there's already another twist in this race. A Manhattan judge has set a trial date in former President Trump's criminal trial in the Stormy Daniels hush money case. March 2024, that of course is in the thick of the presidential primary season. Former President Trump pleaded not guilty to 34 criminal charges of falsifying business records. Okay, Dasha, thanks so much. Now to the investigation into the U-Haul truck crash near the White House. Police say the driver is a 19-year-old from Missouri, and according to charging documents, he embraces Nazi ideology. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles has more on what we are learning from authorities. Ryan, good morning. 
Hey, Joe, good morning to you. And you mentioned that criminal complaint where the suspect is described as telling Secret Service agents that he was a fan of the Nazi party, that he admired their authoritarian nature, their commitment to eugenics and a one world order. Now, this is an investigation that is still ongoing, but a law enforcement source telling NBC News that they do believe that mental health played a factor in this case. This morning, new details surrounding the 19-year-old suspect, who police say intentionally crashed a U-Haul truck into barriers just a few hundred feet from the White House Monday night. Sai Varshith Kandula of Chesterfield, Missouri, has been federally charged with depredation of U.S. property. Secret Service and Park Police listing additional charges related to his arrest, including threatening to kill, kidnap, or inflict harm on a president, vice president, or a family member as well as assault with a dangerous weapon, reckless driving, destruction of federal property, and trespassing. The charging documents saying the driver embraced Nazi ideology, detailing that Kandula had removed a Nazi flag from the truck after the crash, telling agents he bought the flag online, and saying, quote, Nazis have a great history, and describing Hitler as a, quote, strong leader. I heard this loud bang, and it was, I looked behind, and there was this huge U-Haul truck just out of nowhere. According to the criminal complaint, Candula told Secret Service agents his intent was to, quote, kill the president and hurt anyone that would stand in his way. Describing his goal was to, quote, get to the White House, seize power, and be put in charge of the nation. President Biden was in the White House at the time of the incident. He's relieved that no one was injured last night and grateful to the agents and the law enforcement officer who responded so quickly. NBC News has learned that Candula traveled from St. Louis, Missouri to Dulles International Airport. Then, according to a U-Haul spokesperson, rented the 26-foot truck on Monday in Herndon, Virginia, just an hour drive from Washington, D.C. And authorities say that this situation could have been a lot worse. There were no explosives or any other weapons inside that U-Haul. The suspect is expected to be in federal court today. At this point, he has not entered a plea. Joe? All right, Ryan, thank you so much. This morning, there was a new concern about the status of the debt ceiling negotiations in Washington with just a week to go before the debt ceiling deadline. A Democratic official familiar with the talks tells NBC News the White House and Republican leaders in Congress have hit a speed bump. And they're accusing House Speaker Kevin McCarthy of refusing to compromise with President Biden. NBC News business and data reporter Brian Chung is here now with the latest. So we should point out this reporting from our White House team on the talks. We have not gotten response from Republicans yet. but. Where do things stand right now? What are the main sticking points with the negotiations? Yeah, we're only a week out from that June 1st deadline by which the Treasury estimates that the United States will run out of money to keep the lights on for the nation. Now, when we talk about where the impasse is between Republicans and Democrats, it's largely about spending. So the Biden administration uh, acknowledging that they're going to have to compromise here has said, we agree to free spending, but Republicans are saying we want to see spending cut and reduced over, uh, let's say, the next 10-year period. Now, the length of that negotiation is also under debate here, but either way, it seems like uh, the news that we got just early this morning saying that there's a speed bump, at least from the Democratic view of things, does underscore that there's a lot more work to be done if we want to avoid that June 1st cliff that we might be going over soon. June 1st, next Thursday, what are some of the big ways Americans could be directly impacted by this? Yeah, well, there's a lot of concerns over the major programs that millions of Americans rely on when you talk about Social Security, you think about Medicare care and Medicaid. You also think about the food stamp program, also known as SNAP. These could all be programs that could potentially see cuts beyond June 1st, because if the government can't keep the lights on, well, it's going to have to decide which rooms it does keep the lights on in. Now, whether or not Social Security, food stamp, Medicaid, Medicare would disappear on June 2nd is definitely up for speculation. One reason is because that June 1st deadline is an estimate by which we will run, run out of money. It's possible we could actually extend past that, although the June 1st date is kind of part of the negotiation tactic. But then secondly, we don't know how the government's going to go about that process, because as I want to remind you, it's never happened before. The United States has never defaulted, so there's no playbook for it. This is perhaps uh, creating some anxiety for folks who are wondering, what should I or maybe shouldn't I do with my money right now as a precaution? Any tips? Yeah, well, when it comes to 401ks, for example, there's a lot of nervousness in markets right now. Uh, yesterday was a red day on the markets, and it likely could spill further if there were to be more concerns. But look, 50-30-20 method is one good way to go about having a rainy day fund, which everyone should have, broadly speaking, anyway. 20%. Put 20% of your income into savings 
savings. Use the other of the 80 percent to buy things that you want and also need. But having a rainy day fund to get through the bumpiness of what could be a very uh, headline intensive <laughs> next few weeks might might be a good prudent thing to do. Treasury Secretary, other experts are warning that defaulting could potentially trigger a financial crisis. What is at stake here for the economy? Yeah, well, look, this debt ceiling uh, ne negotiation is happening at a very precarious time for the economy already. When we talk about high inflation, higher interest rates, we had the bank collapses only a few weeks ago. So this is a very uh, fragile economy as we kind of already saw ahead of the debt ceiling negotiations. So if we do go over that cliff, then yes, it could trigger a financial crisis because it's going to undermine the Treasury securities, which are largely seen as the most liquid, safe securities in the world. It's government debt. The United States has always paid its bills. If it doesn't do that, that could really drop the underpinning of the entire global financial system. It's very dramatic. But again, as I want to <laughs> emphasize, since 1960, 78 times we've moved to resolve the debt ceiling. Hopefully it's making it 79. All right. Sounds good, Brian. Thank you so much. And coming up later this hour, we'll have more on the debt ceiling standoff in Washington. Take a closer look at the impact it could have on veterans. Flags are at half staff across Texas this morning. One year ago today, an 18-year-old gunman murdered 19 children and two teachers at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde. NBC News correspondent Guad Venegas is in Uvalde this morning and has the latest. Good morning, Guad. Good morning, Valerie. Well, many here are frustrated by the lack of answers and also accountability from law enforcement, who we know waited in the hallways for over an hour before confronting the gunmen. The people here want answers, but the investigation into what happened is still ongoing. But of course, today on the anniversary, much of the focus is expected to be on the healing. For the parents who lost children on that terrible day one year ago, sometimes it feels like yesterday. Other times, like an eternity. We don't ever want them to forget our kids. They had the world in front of them, so much potential. Tom Yamas recently sat down with three grieving mothers whose children were among the 19 students killed. But Onika Mata lost her 10-year-old Tess. Kimberly Rubio's daughter, Lexi, was also just 10. Gloria Casares lost her daughter, Jackie, and niece, Annabelle. They and other Uvalde families have been calling for stricter gun laws and are angry that no measures have been taken to prevent 18-year-olds from buying assault weapons in the state of Texas. And guns are idolized. You know, that's more important than children, our children. You think guns are more important than children That's in this that's, country? That's, yes. When did you come to that realization? The day my daughter died. And the community still searching for answers about that day when it took police 77 minutes to enter the school and stop the shooter. The ripple effect has continued. School District Police Chief Pete Redondo was voted out unanimously last summer, though his lawyers have said he is not at fault. There are local and national investigations into the delayed response, and a state report last year found that the shooter left a number of red flags online, but was still able to purchase $5,000 of guns and ammunition. you got to look internally. You've got to hold up the mirror now. Parents demanding the school district take threats seriously in the future. We're still stuck on May 24th. I think it's time that we start doing something better. Today, educators say they have no choice but to move forward. We've done a whole lot in a short amount of time, but there's still a lot of, of parents who don't feel safe. A community looking for a fresh start with a new campus set to replace Robb Elementary. Construction scheduled to begin this summer, including a massive tree memorial for the victims being remembered today, one year later. And here in the town square, you can see the memorial that still sits behind me. It has been a year. It's expected to be a very emotional day here with a candlelight vigil scheduled for tonight. That has been organized by the families and is open to the public with some restrictions. Schools will also be closed today as the community will get together to remember what happened on this anniversary, Valerie. Yeah, it certainly will be a difficult day there. Guad, thank you so much. The Republican-led South Carolina Senate voted to ban nearly all abortions once a heartbeat is detected. The bill is now headed to Governor Henry McMaster's desk, who is expected to sign it as soon as possible. The only five women in the state Senate attempted to block the bill from passing using a filibuster, but they were unsuccessful. Republicans who voted in favor of the bill say it addresses the rising number of abortions the state has performed since surrounding states banned the procedure. The bill is expected to face legal challenges once it's signed in 
into law. Now, under this new bill, people seeking an abortion will need two in-person doctor's visits and two ultrasounds before getting the procedure. Exceptions to the six-week ban include victims of rape and incest, cases of fatal fetal abnormalities, or if the woman's life is at risk. Travel season is just days away from kicking off. It's expected to be a big one. After the break, we'll introduce you to Delta's Red Coats, the teams that are ready, willing, and able to step in if things go south. That's next. Turning now to the immigration crisis that's intensifying here in New York City. The recent arrival of thousands of migrants from the southern border has local leaders up in arms. Officials are clashing over where they will house the migrants, and now they're calling on the Biden administration for help. New York City struggling to handle the rush as thousands of migrants arrive from the southern border. ¿Cuántos días vas a quedar aquí, sabes? No sé lo que me digan. The mayor saying more than 5,800 migrants arrived in the city last week, with dozens bussed to the Roosevelt Hotel since Friday. The iconic hotel, closed during the pandemic, now reopened and functioning as a processing center before migrants are sent off to their next destination. The city says medical and legal services are available. Nearly a dozen migrants boarding this bus outside the hotel, bound for another shelter in the Bronx. 25-year-old Mayra Hernandez spent the last two nights here after traveling alone from Venezuela with her five-month-old daughter and two-year-old son. Poco duro, obviamente, porque pasé la selva, Panamá, Honduras, Costa Rica, Nicaragua. ¿Cuántos días? Eh, como unas tres semanas más o menos. Leaving her home country for a more stable future. ¿Por qué dejaste a Venezuela? Bueno, por lo que lo dejan todas las personas, por la economía, no hay casi trabajo, eh, ya no se puede vivir. But NBC News reporting it's migrants like Maida that senior Biden administration officials are hoping to discourage from making that kind of journey, pushing for U.S. troops to be sent to the Darien Gap, a rugged and treacherous crossing between Panama and Colombia, in an effort to curb human trafficking and drug smuggling, according to a senior administration official and U.S. defense official. Some New Yorkers pointing out that resources are going to people who finish that trek when the city's current residents also need help. I'm not going to say that, you know, that's a bad thing. It's a good thing. But what about the people that born and raised here that don't have the, no help? State and city leaders pushing the Biden administration to grant expedited work permits. They're ready to work, they're willing to work, and they're not able to work. Let's give them a fighting chance at making this dream a reality. Hoping to alleviate the pressure on city resources, New York City Mayor Eric Adams also busing some migrants to neighboring counties to the dismay of some of those local leaders. We recognize that we are a county of immigrants. Pro-immigration protesters clashing with lawmakers in Suffolk County. We honor immigration. We honor legal immigration. We are a compassionate nation. We spend tens of billions of dollars. City officials have yet to send any migrants to Long Island or even make the request, according to NBC New York. Other big cities around the country also feeling the strain. There are 734 migrants sleeping on the floors of 22 police stations across Chicago, according to our station there. An alderman says the city wants to house 400 migrants at a college campus. I'm hoping they, they find a place for these migrants. Um, I just think we're going to be overwhelmed with them. Governor Hochul is said to be considering residence halls at several state university locations for the summer months. And two New York state lawmakers are calling on both public and private universities to audit their available campus spaces. International headlines now, starting with new information about that deadly fire at a school dorm in Guyana. Claudio Lavanga joins us now from Rome with that and more. Good morning, Claudio. Good morning, guys. Yes, the day after 19 children died in a blaze at the school dormitory, police in Guyana says, say the fire was lit by a female student after her phone was confiscated by teachers. Now another 30 children are being treated in hospital, assisted by burn specialists, psychiatrists and other medical staff. The student accused of setting the school on fire is not believed to be among those who died and the police did not say yet whether she was arrested. Now let's go to Portugal, where the police are digging an area near a reservoir in search for clues in the disappearance of Madeleine McCann, a British toddler who went missing 16 years ago. 
The baby disappeared in 2007 while on holiday with her family in a town 30 miles from that reservoir. The operation is led by German police looking for evidence to link her disappearance to Christian Bruckner, a formal suspect, a formal suspect who is believed to have been seen in the area around the time she went missing. And let's end this short tour of the world in Japan, where a popular festival featuring three huge portable shrines is back in full force in Tokyo for the first time since the start of the pandemic. The Sanja Matsuri Festival has a history of more than 700 years, but had to be downsized and even cancelled during COVID. This year, the three Mikoshi shrines were once again paraded through the streets of Tokyo's Asakusa district, where large crowds, including foreign tourists, were there to take pictures. And who can blame them? It looks spectacular. Back to you guys. Cool to see that tradition back. All right, Claudio, thank you so much. On June 1st, the government will pay out $12 billion in benefits to veterans. However, that is the same day the government is expected to run out of money if Congress fails to pass a plan to raise the debt ceiling. NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster joins us now from a veterans center in Iowa. Shaq, good morning. So what types of veterans benefits are at risk if Congress doesn't strike this deal to raise the debt ceiling? Well, here's the thing, Joe. The Treasury Department is not detailing what would get paid and what would not get paid if that debt ceiling is breached. But as you mentioned, we do know the federal government has a $12 billion bill dealing with veteran benefits on June 1st, the same day that the Treasury Secretary warns it won't have enough money to pay all the bills. So we're talking about anything that the federal government is responsible for, things like pensions, health assistance, disability assistance, disability checks, essentially, and also um, job training, all things that are under the federal government umbrella, but that the Treasury Secretary is warning uh, there might not be enough cash to fund. So, Shaq, one thing that can sometimes get lost is the impact this is going to have on average Americans like veterans whose pensions are now at stake. Give us a sense of how people there are feeling. Yeah, I mean, just kind of get in their heads, in their mindsets. These are folks who many of them are living paycheck to paycheck, relying on these payments, relying on these monthly checks after uh, years of COVID, after a year of inflation, and people just feeling like they don't have much flexibility in that budget. I want you to listen to some of the conversations I had with folks here at this Veterans Outreach Center that provides food for veterans, provides everything from haircuts to computer training. Listen to what some volunteers here told me about the impact. And any delay in benefits could have? Well, as a veteran, I think it can be <laughs> frustrating. I'm just hoping that, you know, we can make the best decisions and take the politics out and do what is best for the American citizen. You know, we're coming out of COVID. We're coming out of a bad economy. They can't afford to go without a check for a month. They can't afford to take a cut. And when things are high. Hey, do you put food on the table next week? Do you pay your rent on time? And once you get uh, behind in things like that, it can kind of snowball. Important again to know here, we just don't know what would get cut, what wouldn't be paid. So we don't know if uh, this will be a priority for the Treasury Secretary as they're making those decisions. But the fact that this is even a question in a country like the United States of America is something that is deeply frustrating for many people, Joe. And creating a lot of anxiety as well. So Shaq, that outreach center, are they hearing from more people as we get closer to the June 1st deadline? Yeah, Lola, who you heard from there, uh, who's the founder of this outreach center, she says she hears veterans talking about this, concerned about this increasingly every day as we get closer to the deadline. She said more people have been talking about it this week than last week, and that's a pattern that she continues to hear. And, you know, this is a center that the utility has definitely increased in this area. Just a couple of years ago, you had a couple of dozen veterans this center was helping to uh, support. Now you have well over 2,000 veterans on a monthly basis coming in. There's a food drive or food pickup that will be happening uh, later today. So this is a crucial center that serves the community. And one thing that they even said is that if you have a situation where disability payments or other uh, support is delayed, that puts more pressure on them when they've already been experiencing a lot of pressure as it is. One veteran put it to me, he said he feels like a pawn in this entire debate, especially as we're heading right into Memorial Day. It's a really tough situation, Joe. All right, Shaq, thanks so much. Appreciate it.
coming up their medications for diabetes used by some people to lose weight. But could drugs like Ozempic and Magobi be used to treat addiction? We're going to take a closer look when Morning News Now continues. We are back with some unexpected side effects being reported by people using drugs like Ozempic and Wagovi to lose weight. Some report, as well as helping with food cravings, those drugs are helping them control other addictions like alcohol and even gambling. NBC News senior national correspondent Stephanie Gosk explains. Hey there, we've been talking a lot about these diabetes and weight loss medications. The headline is they work. And for some people, it's been completely life changing. Now, researchers are looking into the possible benefits they may have on addictive behavior beyond food cravings, including alcohol abuse, gambling, even compulsive shopping. The research isn't there yet, but scientists are sounding hopeful. There's been an explosive amount of buzz around the drugs Ozempic and Wagovi. I'm super excited with the 50 pounds that I've lost. Stories of dramatic weight loss plastered all over social media. Baby, the hype is real. The medications, both containing the compound semaglutide, make people feel fuller faster. But something else interesting seems to be happening. Countless testimonials online describing side effects, positive ones that aren't related to food at all. No longer have any desire to drink alcohol, someone writes. Another says, I used to vape like a demon, quit cold turkey. This person comments, I used to buy scratch off and lotto tickets. I don't even think about it anymore. So technically, like my official diagnosis was morbidly obese. Jamel Corona started taking Wagovi over a year ago, losing 60 pounds since then. But that wasn't it. I would say one drink for me is equivalent to about four or five drinks. And how do you feel after having that one drink? Uh, the I feel miserable. <laughs> Corona once considered herself a social drinker. Not anymore. Something in your in your mind is saying, yep, hmm, I'm just going to bypass. I, I, I You have no interest in alcohol. The Atlantic now asking the question, did scientists accidentally invent an anti-addiction drug? In a statement provided to NBC News, Novo Nordisk, the manufacturer of Ozempic and Wagovi, said in part, Novo Nordisk does not promote, suggest, or encourage off-label use of our medicines. Evidence is mostly anecdotal, but there have been animal studies on the overall class of drugs. It appears to have broad um, benefit across a variety of uh, be behavioral addictions as well as drug-based addictions. Neuroscientist Dr. Greg Stanwood says although the research is in its early stages, there is a growing sense drugs like Ozempic are affecting dopamine, the feel-good chemical released by the brain. The maglutide appear to blunt the effects of dopamine in the brain um, and in that way can provide relief from, from cravings. Dr. Fatima Cody Stanford manages over a thousand patients with obesity and diabetes with this class of drugs. She says roughly 5% have described other behavioral changes. What I've mostly heard from my patients are, you know, those that have had a significant reduction in alcohol use disorder, um, impulsive buying. How big a deal would it be to have a drug that has that kind of effect on people who struggle with alcohol? Oh, I think it would be huge. Many of my patients that have obesity also have a history of alcohol use disorder. Two drugs already successfully treating obesity and diabetes now showing they can potentially do a whole lot more. Just last week, researchers at the National Institutes of Health released a study showing the active compound in Ozempic reduced alcohol consumption in rodents. But experts caution we still don't know enough about the long-term impacts of these medications, and more evidence is needed through clinical trials to make any conclusions about their effectiveness as an addiction treatment. Back to you. All right, still a lot to figure out. Stephanie, thanks so much. Thanks so much. Time for our weekly medical checkup. Is your child using an app to edit their appearance on social media? Well, you're not alone. We have the latest on how parents feel about these apps. Plus, don't feel bad for feeling bad. New studies show guilt might actually be a helpful emotion to have. Let's bring in NBC News senior medical correspondent, Dr. John Torres, to help break down these headlines for us. Dr. Torres, good to have you with us. So just yesterday, of course, the U.S. Surgeon General issued that new advisory for kids using social media. Now there's a new Harris poll shining light on what parents think about social media apps that let kids edit their appearance. Walk us through what we learned from the poll. 
And good morning. I think this poll is very timely because, like you mentioned, the Surgeon General put out his guidelines yesterday as far as how to treat social media when it comes to children. And what the poll is showing, which is a Harris poll, is 7 out of 10 parents are concerned about the body image filters and body imaging altering apps that are out there that children are using because they think that's negatively affecting their body images in and of themselves. And 65% of parents are also concerned about diet and exercise trends that are happening on social media that children are exposed to at this point. And so, you know, it's a very concerning thing. Like I said, the Surgeon General is even pointing this out, saying, you know, this is something we really need to make sure we get a handle on because it's affecting ch children's mental health. So what are your doctor's orders? Well, they're simply right there. You know, check out the Surgeon General's advisory. See what he's talking about in there and how to do things at certain ages for certain children because we know they need these phones. They're going to be using these phones. We just need to make sure they use them correctly. And then model for your children two different things. Number one, how to use the phone. If you don't want them using the phone at the dinner table, don't use your phone at the dinner table. If you don't want them texting while you're talking, don't do the same thing. And then the other thing is model good body health image. So don't start talking about yourself and your own body image and things you think might be wrong in front of your children because they'll start doing the same thing. And Dr. Torres, we all feel guilty from time to time, but that might not necessarily be a bad thing when it comes to how we act. A new study shows feeling guilty could persuade you from some corrupt behavior. What type of behavior are we talking about? You know, this is an interesting study that came out of China, and they looked at people who felt more guilty about things. They found out they were less likely to take bribes, and so they're less likely to do some of those negative behaviors. On top of that, they also found out that people that are concerned about how something like that might affect other people in a harmful way are also less likely to take those bribes as well. And so what does this mean for doctor's orders? Well, you know, simply, it just means that empathy is a good thing. And so work on your empathy. Think about where the people are at this point. As we say, you know, walk a mile in their shoes before you start doing something that might affect them because that could certainly help pay it forward. A new study revealed a surprising food source that could help lower your risk of frailty. Quickly, what can you tell us about this one? And frailty as we get older is a bigger thing. And what they found out is flavanols, which are part of the flavonoids, antioxidants in fruit, are important. 10 milligrams of flavonoids can actually help reduce your frailty by 20%. So what are doctor's orders here? Well, number one, you want to start now because this is something you want to build up on. Frailty is even more important as we get older above 60 or 70 because that can be a big concern. And you don't need to go exotic. You can get berries, cherries, citrus fruits, soybeans. As a matter of fact, 10 milligrams of flavonoids are in a simple apple like the one I have here, which is a medium-sized apple that I took from my wife, so I have to give it back to her so she can have it. <laughs> but this is something simple. Eat one of these a day. Apple a day keeps the doctor away, but also keeps the frailty away. Well, you have an apple, and we still have the doctor, too. We didn't keep you away. You're right there helping us out. Dr. John Torres, <laughs> as always, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Coming up, the summer travel season is just days away from kicking off. It's expected to be a big one. After the break, we'll introduce you to Delta's Red Coats, the teams that are ready, willing, and able to step in if things go south. That's next. This morning, the pressure is building on the nation's airlines, airports, and air traffic controllers with the Memorial Day weekend looming. Last year, it kicked off a summer of travel trouble. But the airlines insist they are ready, just as the TSA predicts summer passenger volume will be back at pre-pandemic levels. NBC's Tom Costello is at Atlanta Hartsfield-Jackson International Airport this morning with more. Hey there, Tom. Hey, guys. Uh, hey, just checking. Do we have Valerie and Joel listed on the plane? Are they good? <laughs> uh, this is going to Bahamas, guys. Are you interested? Wow, it came I in guess. from Columbus. <laughs> Hold it. Going we'll be to right Nassau there. next. It's all yours. Yeah, you got to get here fast, though. Pick it up. Listen, this is right now the pressure cookie, right? All the airlines say they've, they've upped their game and they've staffed up since last year. The weather is good today. Good flying weather here in Atlanta. But when the weather goes bad or things start to fall apart, it's the Redcoats who rush to the rescue. It's the morning push in Atlanta. We're going to try to get you on that next one, OK? And Regina Peoples and Pedro Ramos. We're going to try to get a better seat, OK? Just give me one second. Yes, sir. The Delta Redcoats are on the concourse. All right, Ms. Mary, this is two boarding passes. So you got 14D and 14E. Weather delays, missed connections, lost baggage, gate changes, whatever the issue, the Redcoats are the problem solvers. What's the most common customer issue you've got to deal with? 
the most common would be if they missed their flight due to the weather. Sharice Evans is in charge of every red coat nationwide. What are they empowered to do that a typical agent may not be able to deal with because they're overwhelmed? They can make exceptions above and beyond what the typical gate agent or ticket agent can do. You just open the door to a lot of exceptions, though. Not necessarily. Now, there are exceptions within reason. Hello. And right now, the pressure is really on. The TSA expects 10 million travelers this extended weekend. Atlanta remains the world's busiest airport. This week, Delta says Thursday, Friday, and next Tuesday will be the busiest. While all airlines have staffed up to avoid a repeat of last year's pilot shortage, now it's the FAA that doesn't have enough air traffic controllers. But so far this year, cancellations are running below 2%. So far this May, uh, we're seeing those numbers hold. But this weekend will be a test of the system. United CEO Scott Kirby with Savannah on Tuesday. We, so far this year, are running the most reliable operation that we have in history. But most Americans are driving, not flying this weekend. 37 million of us hitting the road. Gas prices averaging $3.56 a gallon, a lot cheaper than $4.60 last year. But with Americans eager for a summer vacation, it is the airlines that are in the spotlight. Thank you, dear. You're welcome. You have a good day, Mr. Slaughter. I just watched you interact with a customer, and you had the biggest, broadest smile the whole time. Is that the secret sauce? That is the secret sauce, but don't tell everybody. You just keep smiling. Just smile. When they're rude, smile away. Smile away. You kill them with kindness. That's uh, all that we can do. Yeah. That is the secret right there. Listen, she has been a red coat for 12 years, 27 with Delta, so she knows what she's talking about. Here's her advice. If you're traveling this summer, get to the airport two hours before a domestic flight, three hours before an international flight, and whatever you do, do don't sit at the bar until the last minute. They close the door on the plane 10 minutes before departure. You got to be there inside, or guess what? They're leaving without you. Guys, you back to you. You won't be smiling. All right, Tom, thank you so much. Appreciate it. More financial headlines now. Baby formula makers are facing a new investigation. CNBC's Savannah Hanau joins us with that and other money news. Savannah, good morning. Joe, Valerie, good morning to you. Let's start with the Federal Trade Commission because it's investigating whether makers of baby formula colluded on bids for lucrative state contracts for low-income assistance programs. The Wall Street Journal reports that the companies include Abbott Labs, which makes Similac, and Nestle, which makes Gerber. The investigation is one of several launched against Abbott, including a criminal probe by the Justice Department following the shutdown of a manufacturing plant last year that led to a nationwide shortage. Comcast is launching a live TV streaming service for $20 a month. Now TV is only available to Comcast Xfinity Internet subscribers. It will offer more than 40 live channels and more than 20 free ad-supported channels, as well as a free subscription to Peacock and 20 hours of DVR storage. Comcast, the parent of NBC Universal, says Now TV will launch in the coming weeks and it could compete directly with live TV streaming services such as YouTube TV, Sling, and Fubo TV. Many Americans are taking on a side hustle, and a lot believe they'll always need one to have to, to have to maintain their lifestyle and make ends meet. A new report from Bankrate finds nearly 40% of adults have a gig in addition to their main job. Side hustlers earn $810 per month on average. About one-third primarily use the extra income to pay for living expenses, while 27% use it for discretionary spending, 25% for savings, and 12% to pay off debt, guys. All right. Savannah, thank you so much. Sure thing. Now to that dreaded day for many Netflix users. The streaming giant announcing it has started to notify subscribers they will be charged a new monthly fee if they are sharing an account with people outside their household. NBC's Kaylee Hartung reports on what users need to know. Hey there. While Netflix has long ignored and even embraced password sharing, it turns out sharing is no longer caring. As the company cracks down on users who may be mooching a password off a family member or a friend's subscription. Netflix is getting ready to press pause on password sharing. On Tuesday, the company began sending emails to subscribers with a dreaded opening line. Your Netflix account is for you and the people you live with. With that, the days of account sharing appear to be in their final act. Sorrows. Sorrows, prayers. The streaming giant says it's rolling out the new rules gradually. 
asking users to set up their household by approving streaming devices that are on their home Wi-Fi. Netflix says it will not use location data to find out where you're watching. Instead, it will rely on IP addresses, device IDs, and account activity to determine if you're watching from an approved screen. If not, you'll be asked to sign up for a new account or pay $7.99 a month for each extra member. This is so annoying. This is horrible. The shutdown on sharing comes after the company reported a loss in subscribers last year and said the 100 million households around the world that share their credentials are cutting into its bottom line. This should not happen. This is avoidable. Earlier this year, Netflix began cracking down in other countries, including Spain, where analysts say more than one million users dropped the service almost immediately after the rollout. The company called the cancel reaction temporary. But some subscribers here may also pull the plug. I'm not paying for additional people. There's like a million other streaming services I can use. Bye. Still, industry insiders say if Netflix can make it work, other streamers may follow suit. There's no doubt that every streamer is trying to figure out how to get the most money out of their members. If they see Netflix is very successful in cracking down on password sharing, you're going to see other streamers do it too. If you do want to get ahead of the game and grab those extra member spots, we should mention they are only available if you pay for a more expensive plan. The 1549 standard tier already comes with one spot and the 1999 premier tier comes with two. Back to you. My sister in Arizona will be in for a rude awakening. <laughs> Kaylee been, Harton, thanks so warned. much. <laughs> Coming up, we are celebrating AAPI Heritage Month. And this morning, we'll get our blood pumping with America's Asian athletes who are smashing stereotypes with each passing season. Including the ones who once felt lost, like they didn't belong, and who are now in a league of their own. This is Morning News Now. Welcome back. A Minnesota woman who thought she'd seen the last of her diamond ring 13 years ago got it back. Mary Strand last saw her ring in the bathroom where it slipped right off her hand and down the toilet. Despite her husband owning a drain and sewer company, the ring was nowhere to be found and she thought she'd lost the anniversary gift. But recently, a worker at a waste management plant in Rogers, Minnesota, says he saw a sparkle of light during his shift. The Metropolitan Council sent a tweet uh, t t attempting to reunite the ring with its owner. Local jewelers were able to find the match. The name of the location of the waste plant, Diamond Lake Road. I am just now reading this story and realizing this is my hometown. I know Mary. Her <laughs> husband is our plumber. <laughs> and this is like an amazing story to actually report. Rogers is my hometown. My grandma lives on Diamond Lake Road. It's a small town. Okay. What are the odds, Joe? <laughs> How cool for Mary. So happy for her. Happy for her, yes. Well, we end this hour with more on our Golden AAPI series. This time, we're taking our celebration to the field. NBC News correspondent Vicki Wynn takes us from the Olympics to the gridiron with a closer look at how AAPI impacts these arenas, and leading the conversation on acceptance and inclusion. Olympians Suni Lee and Nathan Chen, the NFL's Tua Tagovailoa. Of course, there's golf great. Welcome back, Big Cat! Tiger Woods. Tennis star Michael Chang. Before Christy Yamaguchi, there was Tiffany Chin, the first Asian American skater to represent the U.S. at the Winter Olympics. On the hardwood, Jeremy Lin took the country by storm with Lin Sanity, NFL quarterback and son of a Filipino immigrant, Roman Gabriel. Asian American standouts in professional sports where few others share their history or heritage. Asian Americans are the fastest growing racial or ethnic group in the U.S., according to the Pew Research Center, comprising 6.2% of the population in the U.S. But Asian Americans make up about 3% of professional athletes, the lowest of the major demographics. I was called the N-word. I was called the chink, uh, Bruce Leroy, black and knees. Heinz Ward was born in South Korea. His mother, Kim Young-hee, is Korean. His dad, black. The family eventually moved to Atlanta, where Ward excelled in sports. But off the field, he struggled with belonging. The Korean kids didn't want to hang out with me because I had a black father. Um, the white kids didn't want to hang out with me because I was both black and Korean. Ward went on to play football at the University of Georgia, then spent 14 years in the NFL with the Pittsburgh Steelers. He played in three Super Bowls, one, two, 
and was the Super Bowl MVP in 2006. That year, he spoke with NBC's Lester Holt. Some of those kids that used to call you Jackie Chan and make all those names. And now they love me. <laughs> Today, Ward is the head coach of the XFL San Antonio Brahmas. He embraces his ethnicity and his mother. I'm kind of glad I went through some adversity that I went through early on in my life. My mom knows that, you know, there's not nothing I wouldn't do for my mom. Ward remains the only Super Bowl MVP of Asian descent. His path in finding success and leaning into his racial identity and experience shared by speed skating gold medalist Apollo Ono. My father poured everything into me and he fused this Americana culture with his Japanese heritage and that was my upbringing. It absolutely was a fundamental piece of just being dedicated and being obsessed around what I did. And Chloe Kim, two-time gold medal winner on the half pipe. Really feels like we're in this together and we're fighting the same fight and it's, it's really important and empowering at the same time. Olympic ice dancers Alex and Maya Shibutani are two-time Olympic bronze medalists and three-time world champs. How have you tried to address discrimination and racism through your sport and through how you live your lives? I think it was really challenging for us when we were within the system of sports because there is a certain power structure. But I think as we've taken the time to reflect, we know that it's our actions and the ripple effect has a real impact. What would be your message to young people who are watching and want to get involved in a sport or a profession where they don't see anyone who really looks like them? It's difficult to distill singular advice because everyone's experience is so different. My advice would be to never let anyone feel that being different is a bad thing. With their new children's book, Amazing Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders Who Inspire Us All, the Shibatanis share profiles of current and historic figures that help everyone understand the contributions of the AAPI community. We know that the work that we're doing will have a longer lasting effect than almost anything we could do on the ice. Our thanks to Vicki Wynn for that reporting. And it doesn't stop there. We would also like to highlight those making strides behind the scenes. Mark Tatum, born in Vietnam, is now deputy commissioner of the NBA. And Kim Ang is first female general manager in Major League Baseball history. Amazing. Thanks, Vicki, for that. That does it for this hour of Morning News Now. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.